Let me speak to the accelerating progress we're seeing in artificial intelligence. Over the last five or so years, we've seen amazing progress in automation, machine learning and AI. Whatever Estonians do as citizens these days, it's likely to involve their e-card. This is how Estonia works. Everybody has a card to access public services online. And here's something for the philosophical among you to ponder on. Estonia has basically embarked on an experiment that certainly smudges, perhaps even erases, the connections between state and country. If the state's functioning components can be sent down a fibre optic cable to work perfectly well from the other side of the world, well, will the states of the future need a fixed location at all? This way, the government also knows more about its citizens. To many in Europe, this idea idea of an all-knowing state is a big worry. Digital ID is part of a every regular ID card in Estonia already for the last 16 years. You know, digital identity is automatically created at the birth. A doctor enters the details of a birth into the system and without the doctor herself recognizing this in the background, the system is creating digital identity for a baby. Parents later add the name, of course, without going to any office. And the digital citizen is born. Forget the cash or the plastic. Now your payment option is right at your fingertips. Literally, customers at the Cost Cutter Supermarket at London's uh, Brunel University are the first in the world to pay for their groceries with finger vein scanners. But today, this shop became the first supermarket on the planet to use the new technology. Another step, or finger to be precise, towards consigning cards and cash to history. Works by using a small infrared scanner to detect unique unique patterns in the veins in a person's fingertips. The information is then linked to a customer's bank details. So digital services can offer seamless coming into this world, seamless life in Europe for all our citizens if we take it in our hands to guarantee for them. But this is not the only thing which we need to do, of course. One thing is identity. One thing is digital services. So do you think it's more inspiring or alarming overall to have this kind of technology available to us? Overall, it's pretty alarming because nobody really realized how it is changing a world and nobody really realized the side effect it, it is going to have on our political regime, whether they are authoritarian regime or democracies. All those regimes are going to change deeply because of those technology. And this is a question nobody really asks the people who call themselves. On these screens, you can see that every person in the room is filmed real time. The grid you see here is analyzing my face. Our cameras can now recognize me, even from the side or when my head rotates 30 degrees to the left or right or 15 degrees up or down. All employees at the company have given their face prints. Cameras film and record every move. Meanwhile, the technology continues to advance and researchers are looking at even more complex and, and advanced algorithms for this sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, just a couple of examples over the last month. Cambridge University now say they're looking at a system, they've developed a system which could potentially identify people with scarves over their faces or wearing hats. So, I mean, you're looking at something potentially in the future when this technology really does start to take off, where you could walk past a camera and you're automatically added to a database. You wouldn't necessarily know about it and therefore, you know, as your human rights may say, well, you can complain and get something done, I mean, you just wouldn't even know that it happened. You know, should we start thinking about this as AI as kind of a, a basic human right? You know, if you go over to the United Nations, you know, they have a wall with the basic human rights of the things that they believe in. Is, is this so going to be so fundamental to our society that every country should have, every person, should, every company right. should have some kind of democratized access that AI is a basic human right? And that is a, you know, AI is not an SDG, you know, today. But should it be? Or should it be part of all the SDGs? It's hailed as progress, but also poses ethical questions.
with the rapid development speed of artificial intelligence and robotization, it is no longer a question of what machines can and cannot do. It is rather a question of what they should and should not do. Ethical issues related to the development of technology are clearly becoming greater relevance. They're coming out with a new model in 2018 that I guess is anatomically correct. Okay, but that's even creepier. Talking head, programmable personality. But see, that's even creepier. The closer they creep to being like a very, very uh, sort of realistic human being, the more that actually freaks us out. And let me tell you something, M. Chan, and I know you understand this. When artificial intelligence really kicks in, and we're talking this taking off exponentially. You're going to see these things. They're not even robots. You'll be seeing stories about it. You'll be seeing features about it. Not just, but robots that aren't even robots, that are so human, so human-like. You will see a very scary psychological, psychiatric transformation in some cases. This is like nothing we've ever seen before. I think that, that artificial intelligence is a scary thing. And I actually, look, I'm not an alarmist usually, but when Elon Musk says, look, yeah, he's artificial intelligence is the scariest threat to human society, I'm going to listen to him because he's smarter than I am. Yeah. He may not be perfect, but We've seen machines that can read lips, MRI images, and so forth, all better than humans. We've also seen demonstrations of driverless trucks, this one on a, doing a, on a beer run. And we've also seen DeepMind's AlphaGo win the ancient game of Go, where possibilities exceed the number of atoms in the universe. And there are many more practical and day-to-day -day applications and use cases. And increasingly, we're not even aware that they're there doing these magical imaginative things. But today's society do not need those bank branches. We don't need those brick and mortars. We don't need ATMs. Every low cost smartphone is an ATM now. My own company has 1.75 million outlets in India. You just have to extend your arm and you have a shop, a cigarette vendor or a grocery shop. Uh, on the mobile phone, we give micro insurance. You can give micro credit. The world has changed. In countries like India, which have adopted digital uh, as one of the major platforms, our prime minister has taken upon himself as one of the big pillars is Digital India, in which he wants to connect everybody in the country in the shortest possible time frame. And we are talking about 18, 24 months. Every Indian will have a phone in their hand. On top of that, what has been done is every Indian now has a national identity, which is linked to biometrics. It takes you less than one minute. You put your thumb in any place you go in India. Every store will have a $20 device. Put your thumb in, in one minute, you are verified. So technology is an imperative. We have no choice but to use technology. In China, Alibaba recently premiered their Smile to Pay system at a KFC store. But unlike our passports, PIN codes or passwords, our faces are on public display pretty much all of the time. 
and that makes it possible for the authorities or anyone else to automatically identify us in any public space. Something which you may not be surprised to hear, they're quite interested in doing. And to simply say, I have nothing to hide, therefore I have nothing to fear, is to unconditionally submit to powers of government that are unchecked. Um, and that is to say, whichever flavour of government comes in, would we be happy with biometric surveillance on our streets? I don't think we would. is both the, the ruler and the fact that he has a political system by which he rules. The greatest orator, politically speaking, this world has ever seen. He's a deliverer. He's a consummate problem solver. He is winsome. He is charismatic. He is powerful in both word and deed. And no doubt he comes in and dissolves religious tension as in some ways he's probably all things to all men, quoting Muhammad and Jesus and Krishna and every other influential religious person who's ever lived and somehow bringing everybody together because he is in the mantra of our age, spiritual without being religious. And he comes. What will he be like? That would usher in. If you didn't have the wars and you didn't have the religious tension and you had the free flow of goods and commerce, it would usher in a time of worldwide global economic prosperity unlike the world has ever known. And the world would welcome that. Jesus is saying that day, the Bible is teaching that day is coming. One of my concerns is in the contemporary churches that you don't hear much of this kind of teaching, certainly not on a Sunday morning.